Simon Newcomb March 12, 1835, to July 11, 1909, was a Canadian-American astronomer, applied mathematician and autodidactic polymath, who was professor of mathematics in the U.S. Navy and at Johns Hopkins. Though he had little conventional schooling, he made important contributions to timekeeping as well as other fields in applied mathematics such as economics and statistics in addition to writing a science fiction novel. Biography Early life Simon Newcomb was born in the town of Wallace, Nova Scotia. His parents were Emily Prince, the daughter of a New Brunswick magistrate, and itinerant school teacher John Burton Newcomb. John moved around teaching in different parts of Canada, particularly in different villages in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. Emily was a daughter of Thomas Prince and Miriam Steves, making Simon a great-great-grandson of Heinrich Steve, and a not-too-distant cousin of William Henry Steves, a Canadian father of Confederation. Newcomb seems to have had little conventional schooling other than from his father and from a short apprenticeship to Dr. Fauché, a charlatan herbalist, in New Brunswick in 1851. Nevertheless, his father provided him with an excellent foundation for his future studies. Newcomb's apprenticeship with Dr. Fauché occurred when he was only 16. They entered an agreement that Newcomb would serve a five-year apprenticeship during which time Fauché would train him in using herbs to treat illnesses. For two years he was an apprentice but became increasingly unhappy and disillusioned with his apprenticeship and about Fauché's unscientific approach, realizing that the man was a charlatan. He made the decision to walk out on Fauché and break their agreement. He walked the 120 miles 190 kilometers to the port of Calais in Maine where he met the captain of a ship who agreed to take him to Salem, Massachusetts so that he could join his father. In about 1854, he joined his father in Salem John Newcomb had moved earlier to the United States, and the two journeyed together to Maryland. After arriving in Maryland, Newcomb taught for two years from 1854 to 1856, for the first year in a country school in Massey's Cross Roads, Kent County, M.D., then for a year at a school not far south in Sudlersville in Queen Anne's County, M.D. In his spare time he studied a variety of subjects such as political economy and religion, but his deepest studies were made in mathematics and astronomy. In particular he read Newton's Principia at this time. In 1856 he took up a position as a private tutor close to Washington and he often traveled to that city to study mathematics in the libraries there. He was able to borrow a copy of Bowditch's translation of Laplace's Traité de Mécanique Celeste from the library of the Smithsonian Institution but found the mathematics beyond him. Newcomb studied mathematics and physics privately and supported himself by teaching before becoming a human computer a functionary in charge of calculations at the Nautical Almanac office in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1857. At around the same time, he enrolled at the Lawrence Scientific School of Harvard University, graduating B.S.C. in 1858. <laughs> Pierce family Newcomb studied mathematics under Benjamin Pierce and the impecunious Newcomb was often a welcome guest at the Pierce home. However, he later was said to develop a dislike of Pierce's son, Charles Sanders Pierce and has been accused of a successful destruction of C.S. Pierce's career. In particular, Daniel Coit Gilman, president of Johns Hopkins University, is alleged to have been on the point of awarding tenure to C.S. Pierce, before Newcomb intervened behind the scenes to dissuade him. About 20 years later, Newcomb allegedly influenced the Carnegie Institution trustees, to prevent C.S. Pierce's last chance to publish his life's work, through a denial of a Carnegie grant to Pierce, even though Andrew Carnegie himself, Theodore Roosevelt, William James and others, wrote to support it. <laughs> Career in astronomy In the prelude to the American Civil War, many U.S. Navy staff of Confederate sympathies left the service and, in 1861, Newcomb took advantage of one of the ensuing vacancies to become Professor of Mathematics and Astronomer at the United States Naval Observatory, Washington, D.C. Newcomb set to work on the measurement of the position of the planets as an aid to navigation, becoming increasingly interested in theories of planetary motion. By the time Newcomb visited Paris, France in 1870, he was already aware that the table of lunar position 
positions calculated by Peter Andreas Hansen was in error. While in Paris, he realized that, in addition to the data from 1750 to 1838 that Hansen had used, there was further data stretching as far back as 1672. His visit allowed little serenity for analysis as he witnessed the defeat of French Emperor Napoleon III in the Franco-Prussian War and the coup that ended the Second French Empire. Newcomb managed to escape from the city during the ensuing rioting that led up to the formation of the Paris Commune and which engulfed the Paris Observatory. Newcomb was able to use the new data to revise Hansen's tables. He was offered the post of director of the Harvard College Observatory in 1875 but declined, having by now settled that his interests lay in mathematics rather than observation. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Director of the Nautical Almanac Office. In 1877 he became director of the Nautical Almanac Office where, ably assisted by George William Hill, he embarked on a program of recalculation of all the major astronomical constants. Despite fulfilling a further demanding role as professor of mathematics and astronomy at Johns Hopkins University from 1884, he conceived with A. M. W. Downing a plan to resolve much international confusion on the subject. By the time he attended a standardization conference in Paris, France, in May 1896, the international consensus was that all ephemerides should be based on Newcomb's calculations—Newcomb's tables of the sun. A further conference as late as 1950 confirmed Newcomb's constants as the international standard. <laughs> Personal life Newcomb married Mary Caroline Hassler on August 4, 1863 and had four daughters with her. Mary Caroline Hassler's father was United States Navy surgeon Dr. Charles Augustus Hassler and her grandfather was Ferdinand Hassler, the first superintendent of the Coast Survey. Newcomb died in Washington, D.C. of bladder cancer and was buried with military honors in Arlington National Cemetery with President William Howard Taft in attendance. Newcomb's daughter Anita Newcomb McGee was an M.D. and founder of the Army Nurse Corps. She received the Spanish War Service Medal for her services during the Spanish American War. For her work in Japan, she was awarded the Japanese Imperial Order of the Precious Crown, the Japanese Red Cross decoration, and two Russo Japanese War Medals from the Japanese government. She is buried next to him with full military honors. Newcomb's daughter Anna Josepha studied at the Art Students League in New York. She was active in the suffrage movement. In 1912, she organized the first Cornwall meeting in support of voting rights for women. Josepha Newcomb married Assistant U.S. Attorney General Edward Baldwin Whitney, who was the son of Professor William Dwight Whitney and the grandson of U.S. Senator and Connecticut Governor Roger Sherman Baldwin. He was also the grandfather of mathematician and Professor Hassler Whitney. Topic: Work. Topic: Speed of light. In 1878, Newcomb had started planning for a new and precise measurement of the speed of light that was needed to account for exact values of many astronomical constants. He had already started developing a refinement of the method of Léon Foucault when he received a letter from the young naval officer and physicist Albert Abraham Michelson who was also planning such a measurement. Thus began a long collaboration and friendship. In 1880, Michelson assisted at Newcomb's initial measurement with instruments located at Fort Maya and the United States Naval Observatory, then situated on the Potomac River. However, Michelson had left to start his own project by the time of the second set of measurements between the observatory and the Washington Monument. Though Michelson published his first measurement in 1880, Newcomb's measurement was substantially different. In 1883, Michelson revised his measurement to a value closer to Newcomb's. Benford's Law In 1881, Newcomb discovered the statistical principle now known as Benford's Law, when he observed that the earlier pages of logarithm books, used at that time to carry out logarithmic calculations, were far more worn than the later pages. This led him to formulate the principle that, in any list of numbers taken from an arbitrary set of data, more numbers will tend to begin with 1 than with any other digit. 
Topic: <laughs> Chandler Wobble. In 1891, within months of Seth Carlo Chandler's discovery of the 14-month variation of latitude, now referred to as the Chandler Wobble, Newcomb explained the apparent conflict between the observed motion and predicted period of the wobble. The theory was based on a perfectly rigid body, but Earth is slightly elastic. Newcomb used the variation of latitude observations to estimate the elasticity of Earth, finding it to be slightly more rigid than steel. Other work Newcomb was an autodidact and polymath. He wrote on economics and his Principles of Political Economy 1885 was described by John Maynard Keynes as "...one of those original works which a fresh scientific mind, not perverted by having read too much of the orthodox stuff, is able to produce from time to time in a half-formed subject like economics." He was credited by Irving Fisher with the first known enunciation of the equation of exchange between money and goods used in the quantity theory of money. He spoke French, German, Italian and Swedish, was an active mountaineer, widely read, and authored a number of popular science books and a science fiction novel, His Wisdom the Defender 1900. On the state of astronomy In 1888 Simon Newcomb wrote, We are probably nearing the limit of all we can know about astronomy. By 1903, however, his view had changed. In an article in Science he wrote, What lies before us is an illimitable field, the existence of which was scarcely suspected ten years ago, the exploration of which may well absorb the activities of our physical laboratories, and of the great mass of our astronomical observers and investigators for as many generations as were required to bring electrical science to its present state. On the impossibility of a flying machine Newcomb is famously quoted as having believed it impossible to build a flying machine. He begins an article titled, Is the airship possible? with the remark, That depends, first of all, on whether we are to make the requisite scientific discoveries. He ends with the remark, The construction of an aerial vehicle, which could carry even a single man from place to place at pleasure requires the discovery of some new metal or some new force." In the October 22, 1903, issue of The Independent, Newcomb made the well-known remark that, "...may not our mechanicians, be ultimately forced to admit that aerial flight is one of the great class of problems with which man can never cope, and give up all attempts to grapple with it?" Completed by the motivation that even if a man flew he could not stop. Once he slackens his speed, down he begins to fall. Once he stops, he falls as a dead mass. He had no concept of an airfoil. His aeroplane was an inclined, thin flat board. He therefore concluded that it could never carry the weight of a man. Newcomb was specifically critical of the work of Samuel Pierpont Langley, who claimed that he could build a flying machine powered by a steam engine and whose initial efforts at flight were public failures. In 1903, however, Newcomb was also saying, "...quite likely the 20th century is destined to see the natural forces which will enable us to fly from continent to continent with a speed far exceeding that of a bird. But when we inquire whether aerial flight is possible in the present state of our knowledge, whether, with such materials as we possess, a combination of steel, cloth and wire can be made which, moved by the power of electricity or steam, shall form a successful flying machine, the outlook may be altogether different." Newcomb was clearly unaware of the Wright brothers' efforts whose work was done in relative obscurity and apparently unaware of the internal combustion engine's better power-to-weight ratio. When he heard about the Wright's flight in 1908 he was quick to accept it. Newcomb favored the development of rotating wing helicopters and airships that would float in the air blimps. Within a few decades, Zeppelins regularly transported passengers between Europe and the United States, and the Graf Zeppelin circumnavigated the Earth. <laughs> Psychical research Newcomb was the first president of the American Society for Psychical Research. 
Although skeptical of extrasensory perception and alleged paranormal phenomena he believed the subject was worthy of investigation. By 1889 his investigations were negative and his skepticism increased. Biographer Albert E. Moyer has noted that Newcomb convinced and hoped to convince others that, on methodological grounds, psychical research was a scientific dead end. <laughs> <laughs> Awards and honors Member, and holder of several offices, of the National Academy of Sciences 1869. Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society 1874. Elected a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences 1875. Fellow of the Royal Society 1877. Huygens Medal of the Harlem Academy of Sciences 1878. Editor of the American Journal of Mathematics 1885-1900 Copley Medal of the Royal Society 1890 Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur 1893 President of the American Mathematical Society 1897-1898 Bruce Medal of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific 1898, and Founding member and first president of the American Astronomical Society 1899-1905. Foreign member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences 1898. Inductee of the Hall of Fame for Great Americans. <laughs> Legacy Asteroid 855 Newcumbia is named after him. The crater Newcomb on the Moon is named after him. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has a writing award named after him. The Time Service Building at the U.S. Naval Observatory is named the Simon Newcomb Laboratory. The U.S. Navy minesweeper Simon Newcomb YMS was launched in 1942, served in the Pacific Theater during World War II, and was decommissioned in 1949. Mount Newcomb 13418 feet 4090 meters appears on USGS topographic maps at coordinates 36.5399 degrees north 118.2934 degrees west in the Sierra Nevada mountains Topic <inaudible> Bibliography <inaudible> 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 Newcomb, S. 1878 Research on the Motion of the Moon, Part 1 Newcomb, S. 1878 Popular Astronomy Newcomb, S. 1879 Astronomy for Schools and Colleges Newcomb, S. 1881 Note on the Frequency of Use of the Different Digits in Natural Numbers. American Journal of Mathematics, 4 39-40 doi.10.2307.2369118 JSTOR 2369148 Newcomb, S. 1885 Principles of Political Economy Internet Archive Newcomb, S. 1887 The ABC of Finance Newcomb, S. 1890 Elements of Astronomy Newcomb, S. 1900 His Wisdom the Defender — Science Fiction Novel. Newcomb, S. 1901 The Stars Newcomb, S. 1902 Astronomy for Everybody Newcomb, S. 1903 The Reminiscences of an Astronomer — His Autobiography, reissued by Cambridge University Press, 2010. ISBN 978-1-108-01391-8 Newcomb, S. 1903 The Outlook for the Flying Machine, The Independent, the 22nd of October 1903, pp. 2508-12 Newcomb, S. 1906 Compendium of Spherical Astronomy Newcomb, S. 1907 Investigation of Inequalities in the Motion of the Moon Produced by the Action of the Planets Newcomb, S. 1912 Research on the Motion of the Moon, Part IIA Number of astronomical, physical, and mathematical papers written between 1882 and 1912 are mentioned in "...astronomical papers prepared for the use of the American ephemeris and nautical almanac." U.S. Naval Observatory. The Nautical Almanac Office. 12 August 2008.
retrieved the 24th of February 2009.